As you've been preparing your heart, Laura has been playing that song that says, Lord of all, to you we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Makes us think of the psalmist who says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. May it be that you and I, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, would taste and see and know that the Lord is good, that we would fear him, that's with love, respect, and honor, because those who fear him have no lack. Come, let us worship the Lord. Hallelujah and amen. And good morning. All right, it is a good morning. So here we are already in the month of July. Last week, of course, we were together in the, uh, in the park, and now we've got all of these wonderful things that happen in the month of July, but I am a little bit on edge along with you, right? Now that we're into July and the 4th is over, it's time to buy school supplies, Halloween costumes, plan the Thanksgiving menu, lay, uh, buy Christmas presents. It's basically 2025. Happy New Year! Oh my, and it's starting already, uh, starting to think about what this summer yet holds, uh, be it beef booth, be it uh, folks going to camp yet and or on vacation, but there is much that's there. Uh, there was a beef booth meeting, they touched base a little bit this morning already, and uh, I wanted to actually break in since some of the deacons are there, but as a pastor, I'm asking for, um, I'll call it danger pay, how is that? Oh, Charlotte, it's all right, baby. It's Pastor Mark. I'm telling a joke. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to ask for danger pay. Uh, every morning and every night, of course, I have the joy and the privilege of locking up. And uh, I must admit, I called my wife quickly to say, come outside and look. I even sent a message to the uh, volunteer fire department chief, um, Harvey Jungling, I said, if I don't come back, you know that I've been eaten. <laughs> Folks, Friday night, right in front of the doors that I'm about to lock, this thing looked at me, barred its teeth, I ran away. I just said, <laughs> what is a snapping turtle doing in the middle of Metropolitan Chancellor? <laughs> Unbelievable. Now... I'm not so worried about him, but the deer that's eaten almost all of our garden, our be that Merlin and I are just crying. I have hardly anything to bring to the table this year, so I'm hoping that some of you have stuff. Anyway, it's just there. But we want to say welcome to worship. We have some guests with us as well. Those of you that are watching either live on Facebook or later on YouTube, there are Pew Connection cards uh, right in there. There's a, a QR code you can just scan. It goes right to our website. You can send us a note. You can make a donation. You can read what's happening in the church. And we're just so delighted to be able to have that technology, at least, to do this. And then, uh, yeah, we have guests with us. Uh, again, to the Kellys. We saw you last week, but welcome up north from Texas. And uh, uh, this morning, knowing that we had some pastors in our midst, so we have two, two pastors, uh, I was really nervous. I couldn't even tie my tie, so I put on a t-shirt instead, and you'll see what happens later on. So that's there. We do have worship here. If you're a guest, we have Children's Church for kids ages three through five, so just alerting you to that as well. There are people in the back lobby who can tell you uh, where that is, but they'll be worshiping at their level while we're here, and that's a good thing. We'll uh, all go out for coffee, and then probably 11-ish, 11 11-ish, we'll flick the lights, and those of you that want to come back, we'll have our uh, congregational meeting here. We'll have some pictures up on the screen of uh, some of the projects that we hope to do, and just want to alert you to that. So that's going to be this morning. That's good. I uh, already said that. So last Sunday, we gathered together at the Lenox Park. Uh, we were greeted by uh, quite a few mosquitoes. Um, people seemed to park themselves sitting on the basketball court, so it was quite a ways away. Uh, not real good interaction, but we understood how and why and everything else. But this was the, the team, and uh, it was warm that day, I will say that. Uh, but it was, a, it was a joy and a delight to be able to worship together. And we actually got to do a kid's message, and that was a good thing. And here's what happens. I still have some of these. 
Ooh, did you eat yours from last week, Joel? Did you eat it last week? <gasps> it's all gone? Well, you know what? Here's going to be the... If there are kids, let's see, third grade and less. Should we mark it off at third grade? We don't want your brothers to have any. We'll say, third grade or less, what we'll do is I've got some extra ones here, and right after the service, I'll make sure that you get them. How is that? All right? So, ring pops. I, 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 I hope nobody chokes on these things. That's... But thanks to all who helped with the collections, those that brought squares and cookies and everything else. Uh, they figured we fed about 225 people, and um, some of the extra foods ended up going to uh, different care facilities, uh, both in Sioux Falls and Lenox. Some people bought trays, and um, yeah, it was just good. So thanks to all who helped with that last week. It was a good thing. Thinking of uh, tithes and offerings, I, I wrote this little piece to myself just so that I could read it uh, to you as well, but I asked myself the question this past week, who amongst us has reason to be thankful? All of us do. I wanted to be sure that over the course of this week, recognizing that there were so many things for which we gave God thanks, and the congregational meeting, again, whatever happens, we just have reason to give thanks to God. I think regularly about the importance of every one of us. As I pray for you, not as much as I should, but I'm uh, trying to see how it is that the Lord would increase my prayer life. I think regularly about the importance of every one of us in the life of this church. What a powerful thing it is. And what a powerful thing it would be if each one of us would rally to the cause of Christ on this earth. You give energy, you're faithful, you give time, witness, you use words, you give wealth. As you'll hear later on in the congregational meeting, you at CRC have been a blessing to this community and to our missions, and uh, that's because of your giving in a variety of ways. So I just want to say thanks. Good word, good word. So as we gather in this place, right, we use these words from Revelation. Again, grace and peace to you from the one who was, who is, and who always will be, Jesus Christ. To him be all praise and glory in this service, now and forever. Amen and amen. If you would, make sure you touch at least one hand as you shake and uh, greet people in the name of Christ. Do that, would you? Blessings. As you uh, as you stand, let's pray together, shall we? As the team gets ready, Father God, we give you thanks again that we are gathered in this place. It's been dedicated uh, to your uh, honor and to your glory. There are things that happen in this, in this building, in this campus, for which we give you thanks, of which one is corporate worship. May it be that you would delight not only in the songs or the lyrics that are sung and are meant by us, but we trust that you would delight in the meditations of our thoughts and of our hearts. So we offer our praise to you, and we're so glad to be able to do that with brothers and sisters with whom we will spend eternity because of Christ the King. Hallelujah and amen. Again, have the freedom to worship as uh, the Holy Spirit leads you. If you want to raise a hand, you raise a hand. You want to sing off the top of your lungs, try to outsing me and let's do it together. Yes. 
Spirit was moving over the waters. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the waters. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us.
praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for me. Except for a heart singing Alleluia, Alleluia. I have one response. I have got just one move. With my arms stretched wide. I will worship you and I throw up my hands and praise you again and again because all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah and I know it's not much but I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, my soul, or oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up. In that yeah, sentiment of worship and praise, hallelujah, praise the Lord, right? Psalm 34, as we started, just again, I exalt the Lord, I extol Him. I get to worship and praise together. So it's in that spirit of, of worshiping that we recognize how great He is and how needy we are, God's people. Need of forgiveness, a need for uh, wisdom, need of... Uh, Help, asking for help in relationships that perhaps are strained, physical illness, whatever it might be. So we come and uh, we'll set the table for some prayer items and then the team will lead us and then we'll pray together. So again, uh, Jennifer, another treatment and we're just grateful for how she keeps us posted. Again, you can look on the Caring Bridge of Facebook pages, we're, we're grateful. Crystal and Cynthia have moved uh, to a, a new place about an hour and 15 minutes from where they're at and uh, starting a new base, uh, a youth with a mission base in Taiwan. We'll put the address in the email that'll go out later this afternoon. Carlene, as she continues to heal, 
Uh, Larry Hogestrat uh, appreciates our prayers. He was quite the trooper because of his Parkinson's. They couldn't put them all the way out, and surgery was about two hours long. So I think uh, hats off to all of you for praying, and also to Larry for being... Uh, he, he conquered. Larry the Lion, that's what we'll call him. How's that, huh? Keep Josephine in our prayers as she has the uh, treatments every three weeks uh, with her liver cancer and Daryl, uh, his treatments. And then just thinking of all the folks still with water damage. Um, Shut-ins are chronologically gifted. Bring greetings to you. We got to visit a few folks this past week. Uh, Evelyn Miller and Virgil Clock, Kathy Stever, Verl Van Lowe. It's just all, yeah. And our condolences to Verl. Verl attended a funeral yesterday for his uh, first cousin. And so, again, we think of that. Um, workers in our town, we're getting closer and closer to the end of the project, and now people on 4th Street, at least on the north side, the rich people, Daryl and Helen Smith and others, can, uh, uh, can, can drive back on their roads, so that's a good thing. And uh, families and vacations. Uh, Andrew Stensis starts uh, this week. He's going to be a counselor at Swan Lake Christian Camp. So that's kind of an exciting thing, too, and just thinking of, of, of that. There are so many folks that are doing ministry in all kinds of ways, and we just yeah, delight in that. And then I just added this one late last night, of course, after the attempted assassination attempt. Uh, like everybody says, America, what's happening? And we want to pray into that as well with you. So, oh... She needs another joke. I know it. I, I feel what coming on. Oh, honey. Yeah. Just never worry about kids, right? All I'll do is yell louder, so don't worry. That's what we can do. So there's a list. What about you? We've got some guests with us that are here. We've got some folks going through some medical things. Uh, yes? Uh, what about our granddaughter? Yep. Jordan Cruzy. Jordan Baby in May. A lot of extra work and medical diet. So Jordan Cruz, he has a baby and uh, genetic. Something is going on. The baby was born in May, and we were going to pray. Uh, first name of the baby? No? Pruitt. Pruitt. Thank you. Starts with a P. Pruitt. Got it. Okay. Might as well do this. Thanks, Steph. Having the freedom to do that. Others. All right, then, uh, again, we have needs. Grateful to God for that. But let's always come understanding who he is first. So I'm going to ask the team to lead us. of 
find ourselves gathered together as your people this morning. We're people of the book. We're people who have a love for the one of whom the book speaks, the one who is the word, the living word, Jesus the Christ. So God, as we think of the book, we think of how it is that you called Abraham from the very beginning. You called him to a place he did not know, but you brought him there. And in the midst of challenges and turmoil, you were faithful. I think of Isaac. I think of Jacob. And we move to Joseph. And again, how it is that you were faithful, how it is that you spoke to him in a variety of means. His family didn't like it. They ended up putting him in a well, selling him as a slave, and to Egypt he goes. While you honored him, there were those that were jealous of him. While you honored him, he wanted to honor you to stay pure, and yet he paid a price. To jail he went again. But you were faithful. You met him there. You sustained him. And God, that picture of you raising him up so that he would be able to speak into providing for seven years enough food so that when the famine came for the following seven, he was able not only to help save people because of your providence and your goodness, but to be able to say to brothers what you intended for harm to me, God used it for good. And so from patriarch to prophet to your people to your disciples to the church to today we say again all our life you have been faithful to this congregation since 1903 since its inception how can we not say thank you and then for each of us to be able to say that you are good. You've saved us. And while we find ourselves some facing medical challenges, some of us recognizing that with age comes all sorts of, of groaning, 
my first cousin who passes away and we attend a funeral. A little boy, a Pruitt, whose parents, along with him, facing, uh, how do you live life in the midst of this genetic disease? God, those are very real things. They, they, they are troubling. They can be a burden. We do think about them. Just like we think about this country. The, the, the vitriol, uh, the bad mouthing, the opinion gazing, the, the, the putting words into people's mouths, the reading of children's stories that have run amok, an assassination attempt. God, we recognize that we are a people who are sinful. And that because of your goodness, you don't give up on us. You, just like with, with Noah, in a, in a depraved generation, so it is that you provided this rainbow as a sign that you would never again flood the earth. So it is that we have hope because of your goodness, because of your faithfulness. Again, we go to that Old Testament story. Here's the Pharaoh who wants to have slaves. He wants to keep it easy. He wants to suppress people. And over and over again, you provided plague after plague after plague so that his heart could be turned, so that he would fall down before the living God. But he didn't. You gave him not one chance, not five chances, but ten chances. You are so good and you are so faithful. Would it be that as you speak to us, we who are here today or listening, how many chances have you given to us? You've been running after us. And we pause this morning again to say, here I am, Lord, speak. Here I am, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm found guilty. I want to repent of my sin. I want to, I want to say no more. I want to say I'm on the Lord's side. I want to serve the King. So I hope our gumption help us to know that again the power of the Holy Spirit is in us. That your word which sings and stings has a, has a, a wondrous attraction for us and it's, it's life changing, it's transforming. You've placed us within a group of people, the church, the bride of Jesus Christ who helps us to journey together, to share one another's burden, to make sure we live into our ministry and our giftedness so that we're members of the body of Christ. Thank you for those sitting around us. Thank you for those that were greeted today. It is good when brothers and sisters get to dwell together in unity. Keep us united, we pray, around the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep us united around the mission of loving you with all of our heart and soul and strength and mind and loving our neighbors, of making disciples, of teaching folks the stuff that you're teaching us. We don't lord it over each other, but we walk alongside each other. We want to mentor and sharpen. We want to live into Proverbs 27. As iron sharpens iron, so one person can sharpen another, can encourage us to say, lift up your head like... Like the psalmist, lift up your head, O ye gates, for the King of glory is here. Recognize the goodness of God. Persevere. Stay true. And in all things, again, we will give you thanks because of your character, because of your love, because of your perseverance, you're running after us, you're holding us in the palm of your hand. Pour out your grace continually, we pray. We know we're not worthy. Pour out your favor upon us, your children. Oh. Receive our praise, we say. We sing that chorus again together. Brothers, lead us in that. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so
elders, I want you to be attentive, but I'm sensing that the Spirit wants us to do some ministry, and I'm not sure, so uh, anybody need special prayer? We're going to come as God's people on behalf of one another, right? So God, we give you thanks again that you are good, that you are faithful, that you pursue. (laughs) Thanks for calling us, electing us, holding us, helping us to go through the finish line. To you be all praise and glory now and forever. Amen and amen. Thanks, God. Ah, yeah. All right, if you would, take your Bibles and let's turn to the third chapter of Revelation. Now, there are some people here this morning that have been doing this for a Bible study over in Illinois, and so I'm wondering whether or not they should come and preach this morning. I'll just sit down, but uh, we'll see, Mr. Duane, yeah, Elder. All right, so as you're turning to there, again, a reminder, we've been in Revelation 1 and 2 for the last probably seven or eight weeks, and uh, today we're in the fifth church, which is the church of Sardis, all right? Sardis, so we've gone through four others, and uh, here we are with Sardis, and uh, these are some of the remains that are there. I have not been there, so this is a picture I took off of a Bible website, And um, uh, the word Sardis either means uh, those who remain or uh, those who escape. So remaining, escaping, I don't know how you put those two thoughts together. It seems to be a, a, a paradox or a juxtaposition. But here's the church of Sardis. And uh, I will say that of the seven letters, this is probably the church that gets the harshest rap. I didn't know what to call the sermon. Should I put a picture of a body uh, in a morgue with a, uh, a tag on the toe saying the day that they deceased? Should I call this the church of zombies? They appear to be alive on the outside, but they're dead on the inside? Should this be called a, a eulogy? Jesus writing a eulogy for a church as opposed to a letter to the church. Is it uh, lethargy is alive and well in Sardis? I decided to call it wake up. Wake up. So, as a church, that's what we're going to do because this word is for us as well. With no guilt, with no shame, just God-honoring desires to live as his word would say. So let's pray together. Lord, Open our hearts and minds of the Spirit, that as the Scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord, page 1220, if you're following along in the Pew Bible. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who is the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you'll not know of what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please keep it open. And let's see how we as students can sit under the teaching of the Holy Spirit. So here's the mountain. This is a, a more of a modern day picture. 
uh, mountain, it's T-M-O-L-U-S, Tamales, and uh, there's a river. And here's a bit of the background for Sardis, right? Sardis' history was a, a, a good backdrop for that specific warning that Jesus has here for the church. So he's talking about uh, the church that needs to wake up. There's a story about that mountain, and he's talking as well about some some deeds that they're doing and there's some stuff in that water that again has an impact on the church so sardis was a capital city uh, founded some 1200 years before jesus christ was born it was located here at the foot of that mountain so it was well fortified and it had the river running around it and there was something wonderful in that river. This was a, and is a, uh, uh, a, a gymnasium, they would call it. So it's, it's a bathhouse. It's where you would do sports. It's where a woman had a you know, bathhouse on one side, lavatories, bathroom on the other side. Uh, it was obviously quite large and uh, quite expensive. And we find here, at least, Sardis with their history. By way of riches, at least, there was this trade route. Uh, uh, it started way over in Susa. So let's see, I got to think. Uh, here it is. So Susa, way over in, well, you remember the Babylonian days, right? The former capital of Babylon and modern day Iraq here, where, or Iran. And uh, this big trade route, 1,000 miles, ends up coming past Sardis. And Sardis is just uh, full of good grazing. They raised sheep. There was a big production of wool. And they ended up finding out, at least, that in that river there was gold. There's gold in the Madar Hills. These in the old Beverly Hillbillies thing, right? It's not black gold. This was gold gold. So they seem to be very rich. They... Uh, they built their city up on this hillside, ended up putting walls all the way around it. But uh, it's kind of interesting how Jesus knows their history because he speaks into that, right? There were two times in the history of Sardis up until this letter was written where uh, the people became lazy, the sentries. So while it was that there was a, a, a wall around and while they were up on this fortified mountain... We find that the king, remember Cyrus uh, in Daniel's day? King Cyrus and the Persians ended up spotting some guy who, while he was up there being a sentry, he dropped his helmet, it rolled down, and he came down the side of the hill to pick it up. They watched him and they said, that's how we're going to attack. And in the middle of the night, these Persians end up going up the hill in that only one spot where they said nobody could ever get in. And they got attacked and taken over. About 400 years later, it happens again. Exact same spot. They didn't learn their lesson. They got overrun. In part, they weren't watchful. In part, they were quite proud. In part, they were pretty rich. And we find, at least for them, a lot of pride, a lot of overconfidence. These are things that Jesus speaks into. They had an earthquake in 17 A.D., and uh, they tried to rebuild. Uh, Tiberius, one of the emperors, uh, tried to give them some monies as well for it. But what they ended up doing is, is not living into their past nearly as much. They rested on their laurels. They talked about how wonderful it was when they were a great city. They talked about how wonderful it is to have lots of gold. Um, can I say, on the outside, it was a lot of show. But on the inside, there was a lot of rottenness. Hmm. So the church of Sardis would have known their history. So the words that Jesus has to say, uh, they're pretty right on. In fact, uh, let's think of this for a moment, right? There's seven letters to seven churches. Seven is that number again in Revelation. We don't play numerology games, but we understand that the number seven is the number of perfection. 
So here there are seven letters, and every letter has one of these uh, six items, or five out of the six items at least, in there. You will find that at least for Sardis, there is no praise other than to some individuals. But to the church as a whole, there's no praise. So two of them, Smyrna and Philadelphia, there is only what we would call praise there. But to Sardis and Laodicea, where we're going, there's nothing to say, wow. So Sardis gets, again, the biggest rap. And what is Jesus trying to say? So let's go through the letter, right? To the angel of the church in Sardis. So to, 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 the, to the people in this church, uh, here's Jesus speaking. And he basically says to them, yeah, you've got this reputation. You guys were a real rich city and town and everything else. Uh, you're like the who's who's or the entertainment tonight kind of group. But can I tell you, I can see. And you're dead, right? So who's the one who's talking? Here's Jesus. Interesting that he says, and the seven spirits of God. In other words, he has the fullness of the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit of the living God. So here comes Christ who speaks into a church that's dead, but uh, there's still hope. That, the, the, the thing that just cries out to me is that there is still hope. And even when we think of the church in America or the church in the world, there is still hope for people who allow the Holy Spirit to come and to do ministry and to have free reign. Wow. So this Jesus, full of the power of the Holy Spirit, who can give it to the church, and this Jesus who knows the seven stars, each star, right, is one of the seven churches. So here's the king and head of the church wanting to give the Holy Spirit. He knows everything that's going on in the church, and what does he say? There is no praise at the start. Look back at a few other letters and you'll see the praise. Blank. He, he says right at the very beginning, uh, I hate to tell you this, but, but you're dead. You look like you're alive, but spiritually, you lost it. Wow. I, I, I've got some things. Wake up. I haven't found your works complete in the sight of my God. So they're doing some kind of work, but it's not complete. What does that feel like in a church? Uh, using a, a love fund, perhaps, or in their communion times. Uh, could it be like Paul who writes to the church at Corinth and he says when it's communion time, I don't know what some of you guys are doing, but I'll tell you, you're, get, you're drunk before you get to communion. Then when you're there, you don't wait for anybody else. You drink the wine and you get drunk during communion. He has no good words to say about that particular church and how it is that they operate under communion. Or... When he writes to Timothy, he says, oh, by the way, this is a sign of a good church, a church that takes care of widows and orphans. Maybe Sardis isn't doing that. I don't know. Or if they are doing it, they're doing it for show and not with good heart or good intentions. They're incomplete. What's the motive, right? Isn't God always the one who who knows the churches, right, the seven stars, the one who has the Holy Spirit, the one who can discern, and he looks at the church at Sardis, and he goes, your, your motives are wrong. Wow. Remember what you received and what you heard. So obviously they're not remembering. Well, what did they receive? What did they hear? Didn't they hear the good news when Jesus sent out his disciples, right? What is it? Uh, Luke 9, 10, Matthew, uh, go out two by two and do all of this. Then when Jesus, right before he gets ascended into heaven, he says to his disciples, here's the great commandment. Here's the great commission. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I've commanded you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and, and Go. So maybe they're not going anywhere. Maybe they're not even doing it to people on their street. Maybe they don't remember the good news. What's the good news? You can't pay the price for your own sin. Your sin is so great, 
you need a, a Savior that's a lot bigger. You can't go and give a pinch of incense or, or say uh, to Caesar or any other Greek or Roman myth, mythological god that you can save. You heard the good news. The good news is Jesus saved. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus has come once, and he'll come again. So live life knowing that he will come, and live life to spread the goodness of Jesus to as many people that need to hear the good news. Apparently, they forgot that. Maybe they became more concerned about people who are inside than people who are eternally destined to be out of the presence of God. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard word. So, keep that. Keep the good news. Keep Jesus center. Keep repenting. I, I think of that second song, Gratitude, right? I've got this lion in my lungs. I, I, I want to praise you. I want to praise you. This, this spiritual breathing, right? God, I'm sorry. I know that I'm a sinner. I've done this wrong, and it's evil in your sight. Please forgive me, and you <laughs> exhale it. It's over, and it's done with. And you inhale. Again, God, give you, I give you thanks that you've forgiven me. All my life you've been faithful, and here's another opportunity to live in the glory of your grace. Wow. The word repentance has probably fallen on hard times in the church. Just like the words, I'm sorry, have fallen into hard times in families and in relationships and in communities. It's your fault. Don't look at me. I mean, I... The sign of a church is a church that says, we've done wrong, or I've done wrong, or how have I hurt you, or will you forgive me? as opposed to a church that plays a facade and the community knows it. Wow. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, wants to give the Spirit to the church, knows the church, and says, Sardis, you're dead on the outside. You're playing, or in the inside. You're playing games. You're doing this for show. You're forgetting the good news that I come to save sinners. And you're not sharing that with anybody else. Just like those two times when up on the mountain you guys thought that you were safe and those soldiers came and conquered you, I'm telling you right now, says Jesus, I know you and I'll come just like those soldiers did under the cover of darkness. I'll come like a thief in the night. Are you ready? Wake up! Whew. And yet, isn't that gracious of God? It, it reminds me of Numbers chapter 16, right? Where Dathan and Abiram and Korah end up speaking against the leaders of, of Moses and Aaron. And, and you know the rest of the story. All of a sudden, God says to Moses, all right, separate yourself from them. And all of these folks who are murmuring and mumbling against God's chosen and Moses, and suddenly the ground opens up and it says, and over 250 of them were swallowed up by the earth. But if you look at the rest of the story, it says, but not all the descendants of Korah died. Wow. God's always gracious. There's always a, uh, he's got something. Look at Genesis again. When the earth and the Lord was sad that he made it because the corruption was so bad, but all of a sudden he sees one and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm grateful for you, church. I'm grateful that our heart's desire is indeed to, to, to stand for him to recognize the gift of salvation that's ours, to recognize that all of us stand on the same ground. Nobody is better than anybody else. We've all received the gift that God has offered us in his son, Jesus Christ. <gasps> we get to love him and receive his love. We get to live for him. We get to be the church together. every letter ends with a promise. 
And this one intrigues me. So the walk, they didn't soil their robes. They didn't uh, uh, get stains on them, markers, uh, India ink. Uh, what they're doing is they're doing with integrity. They're, they're doing it in the name of Jesus for Jesus' sake. They're, they're living for him. They're loving him as well as people. And so Jesus says, they get to walk in white robes. What a great picture. And they're going to have their name in the book of life. The book of life is a theme in the book of Revelation, but you understand that it, it, it's really Old Testament, right? Two, two, two quick passages. So here's Daniel. Daniel. We know the first six chapters really well, and then the next six chapters, he's doing all of this prophetic kind of stuff, and, and we really don't spend much time there. But a fiery stream issued and came out from before him. So here he's having this vision. He says, thousands of thousands ministered to him, to, the one, to, to Christ, right? 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Let's pause right there and say, is this the book of Daniel or is this the book of Revelation, chapters 4 and 5? Wow! Do you see again how the Spirit of God is bringing to John this imagery again from the Old Testament that comes to fruition, and it will yet be 10,000 upon 10,000. And it's Judgment Day, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. And suddenly the books were opened. What, what, what book are we talking about of books? So you move to Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the archangel, right? One of the archangels, the one that fights. The great prince stands for the children of your people, brings us to, again, Hebrews chapter, oh, let's see, uh, it's got to be Hebrews 1, 24, 25, right? Our angels not ministering spirits sent to those who inherit salvation. That's us. There is this unseen reality happening. Even though we're sitting here now, we might not see an angel. Let me tell you, they're alive and well, and they're doing what God needs them to do. Of which Michael, again, in the book of Daniel, he does battle with Satan so that Daniel's prayers can be heard. It's going to be a time of trouble such as there never was. Your people will be delivered, everyone who shall be found written in the book. What book? Let's go back even further. Here's Moses. Moses goes up to the mountain and he gets the Ten Commandments and as he's coming down with these two kind of uh, stone tablets, he aghast sees this golden calf that people have built and they're worshiping their idolatrous. And he's, he has a conversation with God. He says, God, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book. If, if you're going to deal with them because they have replaced you, God, the living God, with a golden calf, I'm asking that you do away with me too. But here's what God says. And the Lord says to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, this is not some kind of a group thing here. Moses, you haven't sinned. But I'm telling you right now that those who've sinned, who've done it intentionally, who've walked away from me, who've not repented, I'll blot them out of my book. Oh my. So, what does Jesus say to the church at Sardis? There are people who are living rightly. There are people who, who even in the midst of oppression, in the midst of culture that tries to get them to, 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 to be less than to be Christian. People who, who meld into the, the woodwork, so to speak. But there are people who shine the light of Jesus Christ. People who, 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 who take the bushel off. Those people, I'll tell you right now, their name is going to be in the book of life. It's guaranteed. Wow. Oh. And over and above that, can I tell you? I'll introduce them one by one. That whole angelic realm, cherubim, seraphim, uh, archangels, they're all going to be there. They're all singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And in this presence of the one for whom th there can be no sin. And I get to say, God, here's Justin. God, here's Sophia. God, uh, I'll introduce them. Wow. What a promise. So how does a church in Sardis get dead? How does a church in America get dead? 
Now, I'm not going to pick on, but again, it absolutely gags me. The Episcopalian Church in America changes their logo. How does the church become dead? They change their logo to fit into the culture so that the cross of St. George now has the pride flag flying beside it as the logo of the denomination. How do you get to be dead? Oh, isn't it First Peter, what, 5? Be careful, there's one who, who roars around like a lion, seeking who he can devour. The, the culture is always trying to get us. I'm thinking there are some ideas, right? The church that looks alive, but it's dead. Uh, ostriches get a bad rap. They, they put their heads in the sand to see if the egg's there, and then somehow somebody said, well, see, ostriches are just idiots. Uh, they always have their head in the sand, but let's go with the metaphor. What happens with a church that doesn't recognize stuff that's happening around them, doesn't look to see how they can do ministry in the midst of those changes, a, a, a church that doesn't all of a sudden say, we're just going to be within our four walls, we're all doing very well, thank you very much, and basically the rest of the culture can go to H-E double hockey sticks. Horrible. I, I want our elders and our deacons, and, and they do as they pray, as we, as, as we try to look over the culture, what kinds of things do we need to speak into? Uh, the Reformed Church in America, the Christian Reformed Church, the Alliance of Reformed Churches, uh, Southern Baptist, they've all been in the news with their general synods and their conferences these last months. We want to make sure that we're doing that 30,000 looking as an eagle does and saying, all right, where's the enemy? Where's God at work? What do we need to do? How do we need to be fortified? Those are the kinds of things we need to be alert to. And it could be that the church needs to change. And I understand this, right? Who likes change? Only one group of people. Babies. Babies love change. Can you change the diapers? <laughs> but as a church, we need to change constantly. Right? You've made changes. We've tried two services. We've gone with organ and piano. We've gone to a praise team. We've gone to a prelude and post. I mean, we're trying. We're trying to love everybody here, trying to, to lead. How do we touch a community? Yeah, we've gone through some trial and tribulation. But as a whole, we're making some good changes. People of faith fooling themselves. What, 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 what could that look like? People who are, 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 are Sunday worshipers, and on Monday, you can swear and cuss and run business, and people just are afraid of you. You're a tornado gone awry. It's just not good. The past trumps the present. Oh, if only. Oh, if only. Programs mean more than people. Oh, we can't shut that down. Well, why not? Do we have a program? We're looking at exploring, at least over this next year, something called Alpha Ministries. What's a place where you could bring somebody who has all kinds of questions? Is God God? Is the Bible the Bible? Is it real? All of those things. Where's a place that they can come and ask those questions and not be judged? Where's a place that you could bring somebody who's asking you those questions and you can come and learn at the same time and co-mentor them? Oh. Don't know what it looks like on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning. <sighs> when we become citizens more of the world than of the next, prayerlessness. Here's Spurgeon, right? Believe me, if a church doesn't pray, it's dead. What's he saying? He's saying that when the church starts going, oh, those are really smart guys. Those elders and those deacons, those gals, uh, uh, they're good business people or whatever it might be. But if they haven't prayed... Prayerlessness is operating in our own strength, our own wisdom, as opposed to saying, Jesus, we need it every time, every time. That's why the leadership team, we don't use the word agenda, we call it worshipful work. 
Every month when we meet, at the very top of the paper, it says worshipful work. And we remind ourselves that what it is that we're doing as we have a business meeting, it's spiritual and it is worshipful. And we are not doing it on our own power. We're not doing it to demand our own way. We want to go the way that God teaches us and shows us collectively. So, how do you breathe life into a church, right? People who, who sometimes enter into depression or they find that they're extremely lonely or whatever it might be, as they've come and spoken to me about things, uh, I, here's what I, I, I generally suggest. I'll say, can you do something for somebody else? Give me one idea. What, what is it that you'd like to do this week? And by doing something intentionally for somebody else, you get out of yourself, so to speak. And that's really what we need to do as a church constantly, right? Wow. I want you to have relationships with people that don't know Jesus. <laughs> don't just hang out with each other as much as I love hanging out with each other. How, how do we continually speak into those things? How do we mentor and disciple? I'm not a hireling. Oh, I know, I know, you pay my salary and all that kind of stuff, and it's appreciated. Kathy and I, we, we love it. Oh, Wonderful. But we're all ministers, right? I just happen to be Pastor Mark. But I can say, hello, ministers, all of you. You all have something. So our leadership team says, here's what we believe a healthy church is. People who worship privately, corporately, they do it while they're sitting on their tractor in the farm, and while they jump off of the soil, while uh, they, they see the rain coming in the skies last night. <sighs> And they also realize that as they come together here to this place, how I long <laughs> to reach the shores of heaven, how I long to be with God's people. Team, why don't you come on up? I think we got to go there already. We just start thinking about worshiping, right? We, we, we said we're going to be people who worship. We understand that in this world we will face trouble. That's nothing new. God's with us. He's going to help provide in our tomorrows. Thanks be to Him. We're going to keep learning. We're going to keep studying the Scripture. We're going to keep praying with one another. We're going to keep letting each other bounce ideas off of each other and bringing it to the Lord. And we're going to keep saying everybody has got a ministry, at least one. Somebody could play a piano. Somebody could be a prayer warrior. Somebody could count ballads. I mean, what are we doing for other people in Jesus' name? That's really what we're saying. You can't be pew potatoes. So we want to be a church that's resurrected. We want to be a church that says we're going to keep his word. We're going to be a church that says his name is going to be glorified. We're not going to use his name in some kind of a swear way. He's too holy, that. He's too wonderful. He's too good. He's too faithful. We're going to recognize that even in the midst of the culture that we live in, we're still His. And we have progressives now, right? You can't even see the line. Am I vain? But I love it when you do have a line because the bottom line is, how do I live? It's the bifocal of faith. Every day, I'm going to live as if Jesus is not returning so that I can do that ministry he's called me to, but every day, I'm going to use the top part, and I'm going to keep my eyes on the clouds hoping to see Jesus, right? That's Chancellor Reformed Church every day. Wow. Lord, as we sit under the letter to Sardis, there are some things that we recognize that we're challenged by, some things that maybe are our own opinion, and we think that that should trump all the rest, or uh, we've, we, we, we've not lived into a ministry, or we've held back, we're too afraid, uh, not recognizing again the power of your Holy Spirit at work within us. And so we come this morning and we say, we repent of those things. And we ask for a fresh start and a new start. We ask that the joy of our salvation would return to us. We would say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And we get to do that with God's people. 
And we get to recognize that you came not for the healthy but for the sick. And we get to go to folks who've not yet said yes to Jesus. And our hope and our desire is that you would be at work in their midst and in our community's midst, we pray. And uh, we long for the day knowing that we'll all be together. All who have said yes to Jesus Christ will spend eternity forever. And that's what we're going to sing about now, Jesus. Receive the praise. Amen. Stand, would you? And let's join the team.
church, think of these two things. One, we are going to be in heaven with those saints in Sardis. Can you imagine that? And we'll hear stories of how it is that they persevered and how the grace of God came upon them, how they moved in the power of the Holy Spirit, and all we'll do is we'll turn around and worship Jesus again. Oh, and secondly, we, with angels and the saints, you will be introduced to the Father, to God himself, God Almighty, by Jesus Christ. And when, when you're ushered into the presence and say, here is John Kelly, Lord, a lover of you. And the angels are going to go, hoo -hoo! wow. Long for that day, but live life on this earth for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Get a coffee. We'll flick the lights when it's time. See ya.